Good afternoon. This is Ben Woodbury with the New Mexico History Museum's Friends of History. We'd like to welcome you to the August presentation for the ongoing Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. As you know, we are currently presenting these lectures online uh, dur during this COVID-19 pandemic. We're fortunate to have with us today Matthew Babcock. Matt is an associate professor of history at the University of North Texas in Dallas. He received his BA from Dartmouth, his MA from the University of New Mexico, and his PhD from Southern Methodist University. His presentation today is drawn from his 2016 publication, Apache Adaptation to Hispanic Rule, which was published by Cambridge University Press. His research focuses on the history of the North American borderlands, American Indians, and the colonial Southwest. Today's lecture will focus on the forgotten Chihaney Apache farming experience at Sabanal, New Mexico from 1790 to 1795 placing it in the context of Apache-Spanish relations and Spanish-Indian policy during the period. In response to drought and military pressure, thousands of Apaches de Paz settled near Spanish presidios after 1786 in a system of reservation-like settlements stretching from Laredo to Tucson. On paper, these settlements constituted the earliest and most extensive set of military-run reservations in the Americas. And you will see through the discussion the number of parallels with US government uh, efforts uh, to establish similar uh, or reservations after the Civil War while addressing the, what was then perceived as the Indian problem. The Apaches who did settle uh, in the Spanish settl uh, settlements exhibited mixed loyalties, sometimes serving Spanish interests and other times subverting them, demonstrating the limits of indigenous assimilation into imperial states. Before we start, I want to mention that following this presentation, we will have a question and answer period with Professor Babcock. And if you have questions, please feel free to place them in the chat section uh, below uh, either your Facebook uh, screening or your YouTube screening. Without further ado, here is Dr. Babcock. Enjoy the presentation. I want to begin by uh, thanking Ben Woodbury for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, this talk is drawn uh, from research, uh, most of which comes from uh, my book, Apache Adaptation to Hispanic Rule which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2016. After negotiating preliminary terms with New Mexico Governor Fernando de la Concha in Santa Fe in late 1789, the following July, the four Chihene Ende Nantans, Hasquanelte, Hans Quiadecho, Hans Hesni, and Nas Bachonil, whom Spaniards called Hileno and Membrano Apache leaders, uh, signed a peace treaty uh, on behalf of their kinsmen residing in mountain ranges stretching across most of today's southern New Mexico, uh, from Zuni Pueblo in the northwest to El Paso del Norte uh, or modern Ciudad Juarez in the southeast. In late May 1791, Pasquanelte, a resident of the San Mateo Mountains, whom Concha named General, had relocated 18 ranchos of his people from the San Mateo, Gila, and Mimbres ranges to within half a league of Sabinal Pueblo, a Rio Grande, uh, a Rio Grande farming community uh, located south of Belen, uh, which you can see here uh, on this map. For four straight years, these chihenes seasonally farmed near Sabinal during the growing season using Spanish farming implements and the existing acequias for irrigation. After meeting with the Apaches at Sabinal 
in late April 1792, the governor reported that the two groups resided in separate settlements on either side of the Rio Grande, and in an effort to ensure that the Indians complied with the treaty terms, uh, that vecinos from the Rio Abajo district were assisting the Chienes in sowing three cornfields. By December, Sabinal's close to 300 Apache residents were receiving a small weekly ration of maize at the king's expense. Despite Sabinal's brief existence as an Apache reservation, Governor Concha's agricultural experiment is noteworthy for several reasons. Uh, here is a rare, a rare case where Spanish efforts to get Apaches to farm actually worked, reflecting the high level of accommodation uh, that at least some Apaches and Spaniards reached in this era, uh, and Apaches uh, could draw on their experience in their future dealings with Mexicans and Americans. The Chihenes at Sabina were not alone. A prolonged regional drought and coordinated attacks from Spanish troops and their Indian allies uh, influenced thousands of Apaches to relocate and resettle in a group of reservation-like establecimientos uh, near Spanish presidios beginning in 1786. Stretching for more than 900 miles at its height in the late 1790s, from Laredo in the east uh, to Tucson in the west, this little-known Spanish experiment constituted the earliest and most, and most extensive system of military reservations in the Americas. By the 1790s, approximately 2,000 of an estimated 11,500 Apaches had settled uh, on at least 12 reservations across the Southwest, uh, including at least 50% of the Mescaleros uh, and uh, a group that I'm calling Southern Apaches, uh, who uh, most Americans are more familiar with as Chiricahuas, uh, of which the uh, Chihanes were a part. Uh, Spaniards established uh, their presidios or military garrisons uh, along the river valleys uh, from which they tried to assert control over the region. Uh, meanwhile, independent Apaches, uh, who called themselves uh, Inde, or the people, uh, controlled a vast territory of their own. Inde Goquia, uh, Apache country, which Spaniards called the Gran Apacheria, uh, comprised most of modern Texas, New Mexico, eastern Arizona, and upland and arid portions of Coahuila, Nueva Vizcaya, and Sonora. Uh, this well-established elastic space overlapped the emerging uh, Comancheria or Comanche country, uh, which has received much more attention from scholars. Uh, its boundaries uh, extended from the Colorado uh, Boundaries of the Apacheria uh, or uh, Indegoquia uh, extended from the Colorado River uh, in the east uh, 700 miles westward to the middle Gila River and from the Mogollon Mountains and Texas Hill Country in the north to the Sierra Madre and Bolson de Mapimé in the south. Uh, you know, we might think of the Comanches as being uh, the largest north to south indigenous power uh, in the Southwest at this time. Um, but the Apaches uh, were the largest uh, East to West uh, power, uh, indigenous power uh, in, the, in this same uh, period. Many Americans would be shocked to learn uh, that the families of well-known chiefs uh, or, or Nantans um, from Mangas, Colorado to Cochise uh, and eventually uh, even Geronimo uh, lived within this system. Uh, some of the most favored uh, Apache headmen uh, resided inside the Presidio walls with their entire extended families. Uh, like missionaries, Presidio commanders hoped to turn Apaches into Spaniards. Uh, instead of making religious conversion the heart of their program, however, military officers first hoped to make Apaches dependent on Spanish foods and material goods in an effort to turn them into sedentary farmers. Uh, at the establecimientos, then, uh, Christianization was the last step uh, in the acculturation process uh, instead of the first. Uh, 
it seems clear to me that from the perspective of the Spanish military, uh, these were, in fact, reservations. Every week, Spanish officers recorded the rations and supplies uh, that they issued to Apaches in an account book. Every month, commanding officers, uh, such as in the document uh, from Pedro de Nava, uh, the 1791 document uh, you see here on the screen, uh, Commanding officers recorded the total number of Apaches in each band, noting marital status, gender, and age. Uh, most importantly, uh, in 1791, uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Interior Provinces, uh, Pedro de Nava, ordered that, quote, the territory that each rancheria occupies should be specified, as well as the distance from the principal post, end quote. If Apaches left their specified boundaries, for any reason, they had to obtain a written passport from the commander. Why then uh, would Inde uh, ever agree to such terms and sign these treaties? Apaches settled near Presidios for essentially the same reasons uh, that they and native peoples across colonial North America settled in missions. Uh, to Inde, Presidios and surrounding reservation lands were potentially resource-rich zones of safety, uh, which they could utilize like trading posts. Uh, Apaches, especially women and children, sought protection from Spanish troops and Indian enemies, who included Comanches, Utes, Pueblos, Opatas, and Pimas. Their enemies at this time also included a portion of the Athapascan-speaking Navajos, uh, who were serving as Spanish allies, um, and for independent Apaches, uh, Apaches de Paz uh, could potentially hunt them down uh, as well. Uh, so Spaniards were using the classic divide and conquer tactics uh, that dated back to Cortez, uh, and they made the strategic choice uh, to ally with Comanches uh, rather than uh, Apaches. They regarded Apaches as, as their arch enemies. Um, and so Spaniards and their Indian allies uh, targeted Apaches themselves in their resources, their camps, their horses, and their crops. Uh, Inde women especially were interested in safely accessing uh, seasonal harvest locales for mezcal and other uh, wild plants that they gathered. Uh, second, uh, Apaches sought as many material benefits uh, within the system as Spaniards were willing to offer them. Uh, these consisted of food rations, gifts, spoils from battle, trading privileges in, na in neighboring pueblos, and most importantly, from an Inde perspective, uh, the recovery of captured kinsmen. Uh, in return, Apaches agreed to return their Spanish-born captives uh, and unbranded livestock, stop their raids into Spanish territory, and help Spaniards defeat other independent Apache groups. Lastly, Apaches realized that they could manipulate the system to further serve their needs. Uh, Inde headmen began to do this from the very moment they negotiated peace agreements with Spanish officers uh, by attempting to work as many treaty terms as possible in their favor. Uh, subverting Spanish efforts to make them sedentary farmers subject to crown authority, uh, the Inde would adapt to reservation life by remaining at least uh, semi-sedentary and using Spanish rations, gifts, and military protection to sustain and preserve their families. Getting back to Sabinal, uh, Governor Concha's decision to resettle Apaches there uh, also provoked some controversy from a Spanish policy standpoint. Uh, as early as 1788, both Comanche leaders and Commander-in-Chief of the Interior Provinces, Jacobo Ugarte, uh, voiced their displeasure with admitting Apaches to peace in New Mexico. Comanches who had forged an alliance with New Mexico Governor uh, Juan Bautista de Anza in 1786 uh, complained that they would have no enemies to fight if Spaniards granted Apaches peace in the province. Ugarte, uh, fearing the disruption of the Comanche alliance on the one hand and a lack of Apache compliance on the other, forbade New Mexico's governors from making peace with any Apache. Uh, now, Concha was still able to proceed uh, with his Sabinal experiment, however, uh, because Viceroy uh, Manuel Antonio Flores 
uh, and Ugarte's successor, uh, Pedro de Nava, supported it. Uh, indeed, uh, Concha's predecessor, Governor Anza, uh, he too had established a precedent uh, for resettling mobile equestrian native groups uh, in agricultural settlements, uh, settlements by ordering the establishment of the short-lived uh, San Carlos de los Jupes, uh, northeast of Santa Fe, uh, on the Arkansas River in 1787. Uh, together with Spanish laborers from Taos, Jupe Comanches uh, built and occupied 19 houses uh, by mid-September of that year before abruptly abandoning the community uh, in January 1788, uh, following the death of one of the wives of, the, of their leader, uh, Parawan Aramuco. Parawan Aramuco. Uh, according uh, to the terms of the 1790 Sabinal Treaty, the Apaches de Paz were supposed to warn Governor Concha of enemy Indians entering the province. They were to serve Spanish interests as auxiliaries against the Mescaleros in Sierra Blanca, uh, and they were not to carry out raids in El Paso uh, or the Nueva Vizcaya and Sonoran frontiers, or, or they would not be admitted to peace. Uh, in exchange, Concha promised to fur furnish them with seeds, farming tools, and agricultural plots along the banks of the Rio Grande, uh, and to have vecinos teach and help them to farm, uh, as had been done uh, with the Navajos uh, and Hickorias, uh, whose example uh, he hoped they would follow. Now, the extent of the peace with Southwestern native peoples at this time uh, is certainly significant. Uh, in New Mexico alone, Apaches de Paz were joining the Navajos, Hickorias, Utes and Comanches, the Spanish allies, and Concha reported that all of these nations uh, remained faithfully at peace uh, through the fall of 1790, uh, which in the case of the Gila Apaches uh, surprised him. So uh, part of the reason for the Gila compliance was undoubtedly the, the frequent gifts that Governor Concha bestowed on Gila leaders who visited him in Santa Fe. Uh, in November, he reported that they had witnessed the frequent exchanges between Gila rancherias without any trickery or bad faith. Uh, the frequency of these gifts for, for Gila headmen and auxiliaries uh, increased by the summer of 1793, uh, and the overall expenses on gifts uh, for Indians in New Mexico rose annually uh, through at least uh, 1795. As of late February 1791, uh, the only significant Apache raiding occurring in, in New Mexico was being carried out by independent Apaches uh, targeting El Paso del Norte from the Robledo Mountains. Uh, and these raids continued sporadically uh, during the ensuing spring and summer. Uh, but in May uh, 1791, uh, the Sabinal Apaches were implicated uh, when an Indian from Hasquinaltes Rancheria was wounded while trying to steal the El Paso del Norte horse herd. At the time, Hasquinaltes people were camped well south of Sabinal uh, in the Paraje del Carrillo, uh, a water source along the Camino Real, uh, east of the Rio Grande, uh, in modern Doña Ana, Ana, uh, Doña Ana County, uh, between Truth or Consequences uh, and Socorro. Um, by late May, uh, however, Concha reported uh, the order had been restored, uh, and Capitan uh, Hasquenelte and 18 ranchos of his people uh, from the Gila and Membres Mountains were residing half a league from Sabinal, uh, on the banks of the Rio Grande, where they sowed crops, uh, utilizing the existing acequias. On May 28th, Hasquinelte demonstrated his compliance with the 1790 Sabinal Treaty terms by warning Governor Concha that Mescaleros were going to attack the village of Tome within uh, three to four days, which provided Concha with the time uh, to have additional Isleta uh, Pueblo Indians and vecinos uh, reinforce that community. In mid-April 1792, in an effort to further encourage Apache farming, uh, Governor Concha personally met with the Gila and Membres Apaches in a four-day conference at Sabinal. Uh, Concha tried to convince the, uh, the groups to live together in two populations, with one band situated in the current location uh, two leagues from Sabinal. 
Vecinos from the Rio Abajo district would build them jacales uh, or huts and supply them with livestock for breeding. Uh, since Concha was not convinced that these Apaches would honor the peace when left alone, uh, he had them immediately begin sowing uh, three cornfields under close supervision. The following April, uh, the Apaches de Paz at Sabinal asked Governor Concha for a passport to harvest mezcal, uh, which he granted them uh, on the condition that they return to Sabinal by May 1st uh, to plant their accustomed crops, which they apparently did. In December of 1793, Concha reported that Apaches de Paz uh, camped near Sabinal were, were committing small hostilities. And uh, in October 1794, uh, Governor Concha's successor, uh, Fernando de Chacon, uh, reported uh, that Planchias and three other leaders among the Apaches de Paz at Sabinal were lacking good faith. Uh, in mid-November, Chacon reported that the headman Campanita and his people had left Sabinal, but that Planchias and three other leaders still remained. Apaches de Paz uh, were engaged uh, in two diametrically opposed processes of Hispanicization on the one hand uh, and adaptation uh, on the other uh, at Sabinal and at other Spanish-run reservations. Although a small number of Apaches uh, did adopt Hispanic cultural traits, uh, very few did so exactly as Spanish officials intended. The best examples of Hispanicization among reservation-dwelling Apaches uh, were the Chaconan headman El Compa uh, and his son uh, Nayolchi, or, or Juan Diego Compa, uh, at, at Hanos. Uh, these were the only two known Apache families to live inside uh, a Spanish presidio with Spanish soldiers, uh, and this continued for several decades. Uh, at Hanos, uh, certainly uh, also a, a key and, and unique uh, establishment. Uh, El Compa's other son, uh, Huscaye, or Juan Jose Compa, uh, who's um, familiar uh, also in, in the American uh, period of, of New Mexico history, uh, was fluent and fully literate uh, in Spanish. Some Apache uh, children uh, did become full-fledged members of Spanish uh, frontier society by living in Spanish households or in Indian missions. Um, but baptizing Apache children was not always a sign of their Hispanicization, uh, given that Apache parents commonly requested baptism uh, as a last resort for their children uh, when they were on the verge of death from disease. In the late colonial period, uh, Spanish officers routinely shipped the most bellicose Apache men and women to Mexico City as prisoners of war. Uh, a small number of women worked as laborers in Spanish businesses from Chihuahua to Mexico City, uh, and some of the men worked on fortifications uh, in Havana, Cuba, uh, alongside Spanish convicts. Uh, the vast majority of extradited Apache prisoners, uh, however, uh, either escaped back to the frontier or died from uh, malnutrition, fatigue, and disease, and thus uh, did not assimilate. Most Apache de Paz found ways to adapt creatively to retain their cultural independence. Uh, rather than a radical step towards civilization, Apaches tended to view settlement on reservations as an opportunity to fulfill temporary needs and circumvent the overambitious incorporation attempts of Spanish officials. Peaceful Apache headmen and interpreters frequently started rumors of Apache, revol uh, Apache revolts, and the most influential peaceful Apache leaders also used their diplomatic prowess to negotiate for release of Apache captives and prisoners. Apaches de Paz also utilized Spanish rations and gifts for their own purposes. Typically, when Spanish officials gave them livestock for breeding, in an effort to reduce the cost of rations and promote self-sufficiency, the Apaches simply consumed all of the animals. Year after year, peaceful Apaches confounded Spanish officials by either consuming their entire weekly food rations on the first day of issue, or selling, trading, and gambling their food rations and clothing away to Spanish settlers and returning naked to their reservations. 
Such behavior was not only, uh, not only such behavior not only frustrated Spanish priests and military officers, uh, it also quickly drove up the costs of the system. Another Apache adaptation was allegedly adopting the vices and rebellious excesses of frontier Spaniards and Mission Indians, which included gambling, dancing, and swearing. Uh, Apache de Paz frequently played cards with Spanish settlers and Mission Indians, and they also made their own painted leather card decks using horse hide, which, in, uh, which includes uh, the cards that you see here uh, for the game of Monte. Uh, so these are Apache versions of the Two of Coins, the King of Swords, and the Caballero of Coins. So uh, these are uh, Hispanic designs, um, but they contain uh, original Apache motifs. Um, and, and the cards uh, that you see here uh, date a little bit later than the time period I'm talking about, um, uh, that uh, in, in the period of between uh, 1840 and 1890. According to Franciscan reports, uh, Spanish subjects simply corrupted Apaches rather than helping them to acculturate in any morally acceptable way. Uh, but some instances, uh, such as betting on foot racing at Tucson, may have been cases of reciprocal acculture, acculturation or Apacheization uh, of Spaniards adopting Apache traits. Not surprisingly, the most important way Apaches adapted to living at reservations was by moving off of them, uh, which they did for a whole host of reasons. Uh, these included visiting relatives on other reservations or in the Apacheria, uh, avoiding disease outbreaks, hunting and small-scale livestock uh, raiding, and revenge raids against Spanish troops for attacking uh, their independent kinsmen. Uh, and Apaches would especially be angry if the Spaniards were, were target, targeting neutral bands. Um, you know, to, the, to the Spaniards, uh, every Apa Apache was either at war or peace. Uh, they, they didn't always recognize neutrality uh, as a third option uh, that Apaches had. Given the amount of resistance and adaptation that especially Apache men uh, were engaged in, uh, this was an extremely fragile and uneasy peace uh, even from a Spanish perspective. Uh, but we can still identify three uh, reciprocal benefits that Apaches and Spaniards uh, experienced uh, from the 1790s uh, through the 1820s under this system. Uh, first, the reduction and compartmentalization of Apache raids on the one hand uh, and uh, Spanish military uh, offenses on the other uh, helped uh, to reduce violence uh, in the region. Second, uh, it helped, uh, the system helped produce several decades of Spanish economic, demographic, and northward territorial expansion, uh, where the Spanish Apache peace was most enduring uh, west of the Rio Grande uh, in western Nueva Vizcaya, uh, Sonora, uh, and parts of New Mexico. Uh, third uh, was an unintended consequence for Spaniards, uh, it enabled Apaches to rebuild their war-ravaged culture uh, and eventually reassert their cultural independence. The truth is uh, that this system began to decline much earlier and more unevenly than many scholars have asserted uh, east of the Rio Grande, uh, and it did so well before the Mexican War for Independence uh, in the 1810s. The Lapons were on the fringe of the system to begin with, uh, and in February 1794, Mescaleros were the first pacified group uh, to try to reassert their cultural uh, independence uh, when they deserted their reservations at El Paso del Norte uh, and San Elisario in protest of Spanish punitive expeditions against their independent relatives. Uh, and they would form an alliance with Inde groups west of the Rio Grande uh, and fight uh, against Spaniards until at least 1799. In response to the Mescalero uprising, uh, the lack of farming by at least most Apaches de Paz, uh, and also Spain's draining war with the French Republic from 1793 uh, through 95, 
uh, Commander-in-Chief Pedro de Nava decided to ban Apaches from visiting him in Chihuahua. Uh, he also required them to settle 30 leagues from Spanish presidios and settlements, uh, and he reduced their rations. His decisions nearly hastened, uh, clearly hastened uh, the collapse of Sabinal, uh, which is poorly understood. Uh, previous scholars have mistakenly argued that Comanches destroyed the reservation or that it gradually withered away because Spaniards lost interested uh, lost interest in fostering it. For nearly a decade uh, after the Spanish-influenced breakup of the, of the Chihene, uh, Diné, or Navajo Alliance uh, in, on, on October of 1786, Navajos, uh, not Comanches, were the major uh, indigenous threat to Chihenes. Uh, Navajos' repeated killing of Chihene adults and capturing of small children, uh, including the treacherous assassination of Nantan uh, Napatuli, uh, who was also known as Tecalote or Owl, uh, and eight other Chihene, Chihene men during peace negotiations uh, in the Dineta, uh, or Navajo homeland, uh, in July uh, 1791, did not ruin Sabinal either. Instead, uh, this violence was likely a major reason uh, that so many Chihene families relocated to the uh, Rio Grande community uh, under General uh, Hasquinalti's leadership uh, from 1790 to 94 in the first place. Uh, in the fall of 1793, independent Chihenes successfully avenged Napachuli's assassination and subsequent Navajo attacks uh, in their camps in the San Mateo Mountains by attacking them uh, 40 leagues from Laguna Pueblo uh, in the Paraje de Guadalupe, and killing General Antonio Alpinto. Governor Concha's own deteriorating health uh, and changes in Spanish policy, uh, not Comanche or Navajo-initiated violence, uh, were major factors uh, precipitating uh, Sabinal's collapse in late 1794. Suffering from a key eye injury that had plagued him for at least three years and, and left him permanently disabled, uh, Governor Concha left office in late fall of 1793 and rode south with the pack train to Chihuahua, uh, where he became a patient uh, at the Army Hospital. His successor, Fernando de Chacon, who profoundly mistrusted Apaches, opposed Concha's efforts and offered no support uh, to the Sabinal Apaches. Uh, taking advantage of Concha's departure, uh, and his own uh, late October policy change in Nueva Vizcaya. Uh, in December of 1794, uh, Commander-in-Chief Nava uh, ordered Governor Chacon to have the Apaches at Sabinal and any other Indios de Paz in New Mexico uh, to settle 30 leagues from Spanish presidios and settlements to remain independent and be subject to Spanish attack. Although scholars have suggested that Apaches never returned to Sabinal after 1794, uh, that uh, too is not the case. In May of 1795, 16 Apache families remained at peace near the Pueblo uh, and throughout the spring, Chacon, uh, following Nava's orders uh, much more closely than Concha usually did, uh, repeatedly rebuffed Apache emissaries requesting to return there. Uh, when an Apache woman carrying a cross requested peace at Sabinal in late July and complained of Spanish attacks on her people, uh, who had done nothing wrong, uh, Sandia Pueblo Auxiliaries seized her and tried to bring her to Santa Fe. After she escaped near the Sandia Mountains, the Auxiliaries hunted her down, killed her, and presented her severed ears to Governor Chacon. Meanwhile, a former Apache State Paz from Sabinal most likely in concert with their independent kinsmen, responded to the Spanish policy of removal and escalation of violence toward them by defiantly camping inside of Nava's 30-league limit and boldly striking settlements in the Laguna, Albuquerque, and Tomei districts of New Mexico. Across the Spanish frontier uh, during the 1790s, uh, a minority of Apaches de Paz uh, worked together with Spaniards 
to reduce violence in the region by serving as scouts and auxiliaries. While the majority relied on movement, trading, and small-scale livestock raiding, which Spanish soldiers and settlers were supposed to tolerate uh, because in the words of Viceroy Bernardo de Galvez, a bad peace is better than a good war. These dual strategies caused confusion, disruption, uh, disruptions and results that Spanish policymakers never intended, but that does not mean that the establecimientos were a failure. Instead, they enabled the system to endure and function, lar and function largely on in-day terms uh, in the in-day to reassert their political and territorial sovereignty by 1832. Yet the power balance between Apaches and Spaniards in the late 18th century was very even. The chief material benefit Apaches obtained from Spaniards from 1778 to 1795 was stolen livestock. Apaches captured more than 23,000 Spanish horses, mules, and cattle, with Spaniards recovering less than half of them uh, at almost 9,000. Uh, the chief material benefits Spaniards obtained from Apaches were Apache captives and prisoners, especially women and children. You can see a huge disparity there, uh, 1,254 uh, versus 78. Now the killing was virtually even on both sides, uh, 1,089 Apaches uh, to 929 Spaniards. Um, so this was not an absolute Spanish military victory uh, by, by any means. Uh, and we can understand, uh, get some understanding on the negotiating that was taking place here uh, with the potential for Apaches to exchange stolen livestock for Spanish-held uh, captive Apaches explaining uh, a lot of the peace agreements. Uh, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, and indeed, the Sabinal Peace Treaty uh, and subsequent resettlement uh, remain uh, unique uh, because of the extent uh, of Apache farming uh, that did occur there. Uh, and 60 years later, during the 1850s, uh, Chihene, Mimbres, uh, and Ojo Caliente, <coughs> Nantans, uh, including Mangas Colorados uh, and Baishan, or uh, Cuchillo Negro, who you see here uh, in this painting, uh, would draw on this prior experience uh, at the Establecimientos uh, by negotiating uh, similar accords with Indian agent Michael Steck and Governor David Merriweather uh, in New Mexico. Uh, raising hundreds of acres of corn along the Membrace and Gila rivers. Uh, what Inde would succeed in retaining during this brutally violent period uh, from the 1830s to the 1850s, following the collapse of the Establecimientos, uh, was the vast majority of their homeland. Uh, now, obviously, uh, this would change during the 1860s, um, uh, but this is an interesting a uh, development of uh, a uh, equestrian uh, mobile group uh, reasserting uh, their cult cultural uh, independence and returning to their homeland uh, for a 30-year period. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I think I'll wrap things up there uh, and just leave you uh, with an image of uh, my book, again, Apache Adaptation to Hispanic Rule, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2016. Uh, it's available uh, through Amazon or, or through Cambridge, uh, the Cambridge website. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and I do look forward uh, to answering some of your questions.